Okay. Hello, listeners. Today I am with the photographer Luis. Would you like to introduce yourself for a little bit? Um, yeah, of course. Uh, so my name is Luis Osavas. I am a first generation uh, immigrant. Uh, my parents brought me here when I was uh, eight years old. Wow. So I've spent most of my life here in Atlanta. This is where I'm based. Um, but I, uh, I try to take a lot of inspiration from my culture. So I like it's one of my, my biggest drivers is uh, where I come from. And um, I focus a lot on my photography. Actually, one of my biggest influences is Frida and because uh, she did a lot of self-portraiture. And so I take a lot of inspiration from her work and um, try to show my story and the story of people like me who don't have a voice through my mm -hmm. artwork. That's awesome. How did you first get introduced to Frida and her works? Um, I don't even know. I think that she's just always been a such a huge fixture of art and culture, specifically for uh, Mexican people, um, mm -hmm. that I don't remember necessarily a moment where, like there wasn't one specific moment that she changed me or influenced me. She's just always been there. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't until I was a teenager though that I started really like learning more about her um, and her struggles and the fact that she used her art as a way to um, basically deal out her trauma and that connected a lot with me. That's awesome. Was she like a source of inspiration or motivation for you to get into the artistic realm of things? I think that she, I don't know how do I, how do I describe it? I think that she gave me, it made me feel valid because mm -hmm. a lot of, especially in photography, most photographers um, photograph other people. Um, and most photographers, I mean, I do uh, have do work with other people and I do, you know, do photography that's a little bit more commercial. But when I at my core and my personal art is all self portrait. Uh, and when I started doing research on her, her main like the one thing that really stuck with me is the reason that she paints herself over and over is because what else is she supposed to paint? She only knows herself like mm -hmm. you're the person who knows herself for like the best. So, of course, that like her subject she painted what she understood and what she understood was herself. And that that always kind of like stuck with me, um, especially I was a very awkward and um, quiet kid as a very obvious, I mean, I had a lot of femininity aspects to me that were very quickly um, told to me was a bad thing as a mm -hmm. boy in, in, in the world. Um, and so as a queer child, I didn't have very many friends uh, and I wanted to take pictures and I didn't have anyone but myself. So it became, it was an accident that I started doing it and she kind of made me feel valid because she was somebody who was famous for doing what I enjoyed doing, which was just um, making myself look different and then photographing it. Um, I don't have any artistic talent in painting. So it was kind of like my way of painting by myself. I see, that's awesome. And yeah, I do think it is very important to just have the source that you can tap into to make you feel valid as a person. Mm -hmm. um, I've noticed that you have a lot of affection for uh, like blues, pinks, and yellows as dominant colors <laughs> in your photography. Is there I any do, reason yeah. why you gravitate towards those colors more than like secondary colors? I honestly have no idea. It's really strange because it wasn't until, because uh, you're not the first person who's pointed this out to me. Um, but I, I, I'm sure you've noticed if you've gone through any of my, any on anything on my Instagram, I yeah. do. I'm really drawn to monochromatic images. Um, I'll pick one specific color, and the whole image is based on that. Uh, one of my favorite projects that I did um, during 2020 was my Pride project. I did oh, yeah. the original. I'm so proud of the uh, of that whole series, and it was really cool to have a specific because I did the original Pride flag. Um, and I did one single, like I did a portrait for each one of the colors, but for some reason, I'm literally right now, I'm wearing a pink beret and a pink shirt. Um, I'm just drawn to, there's something about cool tones that just kind of bring me in and the lighter colors, I think is a little bit of rebellion as well, um, because mm -hmm. for so much of my life, pink is not for boys, uh, baby blue is, you know, not for boys, all these colors that I thought were beautiful and I was told that I could not wear. Um, now as an adult, uh, I wear them almost as a form of rebellion, as a claiming awesome. that these are, yeah, so 
Um, I'm not really sure why I'm drawn to them. I just find myself, I don't know why, just collecting pink, uh, light blues, um, teals. I just love that, like, yeah, just colors that were essentially being told that I could not have them. So now I overcompensate probably. Yeah, I think you honestly own these colors, especially that baby blue and the soft bubblegum pink. Like mm -hmm. you look great in them. Also, oh, I think you. that as an artist myself, I just feel like you don't pick your favorite colors. Your favorite colors just kind of pick you in yeah. a way. Yeah, I'm just drawn to them. And it's not like I ever made the conscious decision to collect so much pink in my wardrobe. Mm -hmm. um, there was a couple a couple of years ago. So I worked uh, before I um, before I stopped. I My uh, goal was to actually work in fashion. That's actually, oh, really? yeah. So uh, I, I'm really, I love, love fashion photography. Um, I mean, I photograph myself and I style myself. Uh, but I worked in retail for a while and I was working towards being a, I was a stylist in a store, um, but I was working towards like high end. I'm really drawn into, I mean, I can't deny I love designer clothing, um, mm -hmm. but then there was a point where it just was not really vibing with who I was becoming. So I stepped away from fashion, but I mean, obviously it's still going to be a really big part of my life. Uh, but there was a, about a two year period where I think they call it millenn millennial pink. It was like a soft pink, got pink. super, super popular. Yeah, it got super popular. Uh, and since I was working in fashion, there was just an abundance of pink. So I just collected it and collected it. Um, and that's honestly why you find a lot of my pictures have so much pink in it. Because when I was working in fashion, I, was, I had the um, ability to be around clothes all day long. Uh, and I worked in women's uh, clothing stores mostly. So mm -hmm. a lot of the clothing that I wore was a little bit more feminine or um, just like that pastel color. So they don't really make a lot of uh, men's clothing. Um, yeah, it, it, and like, I definitely agree with your colors kind of find you. I don't know, I like, I, I really appreciate your compliment saying that I look good in pink um, because I think so as well. There's just something about the way it sits on my skin because I have a yes, little bit yes. of, yeah, I just have a little bit of olive in my, in my skin tone. So it just, it doesn't wash me out. And I was always afraid that if I wore like that light pink, that it would be too light. Um, but no, I, I drawn to it and love it. And just like you said, uh, my, my favorite colors just kind of chose me. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I was just going to say, like, I think pink looks go, so good on your skin, especially. And it feels like really glow and add this sweet softness to your eyes. It's just a good color for you. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. it, for some reason, I didn't realize that brown eyes and pink look gorgeous together. Yeah. Like there's just mm -hmm. something about, it pulls out that little bit of warmth. And since my eyes uh, can photograph really, really dark or really light, depending, well, not really light, but lighter, depending mm -hmm. on the color that I'm wearing. And the pink just makes them look lighter. It makes them look softer. Um, if I'm being completely honest, day to day, I live in black. I am blacked out, black everything, black on black. It's uh, It definitely happened from working in fashion for so long because that's basically what you have to wear when you're working in fashion. Um, but I, I just, on my days where I want to feel softer or happier, pinks and yellows, they just, they, they pull me in so quickly. Mm -hmm beautiful happy bright colors just to give you the right vibe also i just saw the uh, millennial pink wow it is so sweet and tender i love this color so much right because it's it's not like that bubblegum pink it's just mm -hmm. that soft it's like a soft there's a little bit of almost creaminess to it that i yes. just like, so drawn to mm -hmm. it's more naturally pleasing to the eye it feels a little bit more organic it's not really overpowering or anything mm -hmm. yeah definitely but good thing you did uh, mention your pride photography because the next question is about it. Um, awesome. <laughs> what of the day slash colors that you did was red and you talked about how the red was the color for HIV as the advocacy and fighting against HIV is an ongoing conversation. What do you mm -hmm. think the next or younger generation could do differently to increase that conversation? I think that we shouldn't downplay it. I think that we need to remind, like, we need to remind ourselves and each other that we lost an entire generation, an entire generation of our people um, to this virus, right? Uh, I try to speak really openly about it, um, what, especially because I know that I have 
this strange privilege where my photography doesn't just um, attract or resonate with queer people, but I have a lot of um, cis straight women who are really, you know, endeared with me and have been mm -hmm. following me for years and are really sweet. And when I speak openly about HIV, it's something that they don't hear regularly. Um, and I've even had uh, like one of my one of my very, very close friends, she said that it was the first time that she'd ever heard anybody actually talk about it wow. without instantly going into the shaming or instantly going into the, well, it's just something that that affects gay men. No, it's it's something that's really serious. To me, I think that the biggest thing we cannot do is think that it's over only because people can live healthy lives uh, and become undetectable and you know thrive with the virus does not mean that we can just pretend that it's not harming people because um, unfortunately something um, that I've learned in the last year or two from being more outspoken about HIV is how disproportionate the effects are on poor and people of color mm -hmm. um, whereas you know, we only see even, you know, when we uh, think about things like PrEP, when you think about PrEP, um, most of my friends who are um, men of color, who are uh, gay, they did not feel that they had access to it. They did not feel that they could afford it. And a lot of the conversation, a lot of the faces that we see when we hear about um, medications like that are upper middle class white men yeah. are the ones that can afford it, right? So I think that by never dulling down the ongoing effects because even even if everybody can get prep it is still something that affects a lot of people not everybody handles the medications uh, well th there's just a lot of factors that go into it um, yeah. what we can never or at least for me i can never dim down the effect that it has on our communities and that it has had on our communities so never forgetting where we came from never forgetting what we lost um, but also talking about it openly uh, and not always in a negative or a savior mentality, but it needs yes. to be an open conversation. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, yes, we, we're trying to find a cure, but we still have to show compassion and love to uh, our family who is uh, infected. It, it's just a, it's hard for me to talk about it without tearing up because I have personal friends who are positive. Um, mm -hmm. Luckily, they have been able to have access to the medications and they've been able to become, uh, you know, undetectable. Um, but the fact that people don't even know that undetectable is a thing. Yeah. Um, it, it's just lack of um, communication and, and talking and not demonization. Um, we can't pretend that it hasn't affected and that it's not continuing to affect people. So I definitely think that the biggest thing is just constantly remembering, even if, you know, and I'm being very optimistic, in 10 years we're able to fully, you know, find a cure and are able to, we have already lost a lot of people to this. And when you forget how things can affect our communities, it can happen again in other ways. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely do think that it's just, open conversation and willingness to not necessarily, because, you know, it, it's harder for me to just assume that people can feel empathetic for the people that I love, right? Mm -hmm. But when you're constantly are told that it happens to other people, your lack of empathy happens naturally. You don't see it happening to your people. You don't see it happening to you. Um, but the, the thing is that it can happen to anybody. It, anybody can, it, it does not care about where you're from, who you are. You can be the most famous person in the world and you're treated the same, you know, when it comes to this. Um, I definitely do think that uh, there's a lot of, especially in the younger people. I mean, I'm, I'm 30 now. So when I say younger, I mean literally anybody under 30. Um, but there's a lot of, um, pretending that it's not happening anymore. Or um, basically, if you don't talk about it, it doesn't exist and that it can't be like that. It, it just can never, I just don't think that we'll ever be able to find a cure if we don't um, delve into the issues fully and don't sugarcoat it, if that makes any mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, it does.
I also think it's important, you know, to not only continue to talk about it, but give people who are affected by this the platform to do so. And it's not just, you know, white gay men. I think that we need to do a lot more to spotlight the voices of, say, like Asians or indigenous folks who are impacted mm-hmm. by this. And of course, HIV doesn't just affect gay men. It affects women no. too, transgender, mm-hmm. non-binary, people of color, and also people who use drugs. Like, I yeah. think we need to increase the conversation and continue with it, but I think we need to delve into the other intersections that HIV affects because yeah. it's not good to have just one face of HIV. HIV, like you, HIV, like you said, affects everyone. It doesn't care what your identity is. Yeah. And by keeping it um, something, I think that one of the negative things that happens when we only have one face to something like this is that um, the rest of the the rest of the world is ignored, right? Like so, mm-hmm. um, and we have to also remember that there's a lot of cultural barriers where, um, you know, I I I don't want to misquote, but I believe that over, I think it's over sixty. 65 or 69 percent is one of those two numbers I believe Mm -hmm. um I'm so sorry if I'm wrong but of all new HIV infections come from um black POC and like indigenous communities in general Mm -hmm. um and that is just insane to me and a lot of it comes from there's a lot of homophobia and shaming and I mean I can only speak from my community and from my personal experience, but as a Mexican gay person, um, you're shunned pretty intensely or you can be shunned very intensely, Um, especially in Mexico, a lot of people are Catholic and uh, you don't talk about things like this. You You don't seek help because of your fear and your shame. And I definitely think that we need to work harder on destigmatizing um, speaking out about HIV as a whole. Um, I think that it's super important for people who have platforms um, like you or me or literally anybody who has an audience, even if it's mm-hmm. an audience of two, to speak out um, even if we personally are not being affected by it. Uh, because most people who are being affected by it don't feel comfortable talking yeah. about it. It's very painful to them. It's very personal to them. Um, I speak out because I know that there are so many people who the only thing that they have different from me is that I have, I, I don't know. It's just, it's so hard to talk about it. Sorry. I get a little choked up. It's all right. Um, Take your time. When I think, yeah. When I think about um, how disproportionately people are affected and um, a lot of it has to, like it comes from internalized um, shame. Mm-hmm. Um, we have to work on the destigmatization of it because that that's what I honestly think is one of the biggest issues. Um, but also we have to remember that a lot of people don't learn unless they have a personal experience, whether For that's sure. meeting somebody, um, hearing somebody talk about it. So I try to be that bridge with people who I am a little bit more palatable to them than other people are. Um, just mm-hmm. because of the way maybe I present myself or because I am covered in, like you said, you know, my pretty pink things, people are a little bit more likely to listen or pay attention to me because they don't, when you see a face that you don't necessarily associate with something saying something that you didn't even think about before, I just feel like it kind of is able to grasp you a little bit more. Yeah, it's a novel uh, experience. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I do agree. Uh Wow, I kind of lost my train of thought, but not only do we need to speak up and like destigmatize, I think we need to address the institutions that are enforcing mm-hmm. the stigmatization, like communities of color, especially for black people, uh, sorry, uh, religious communities, especially for people of color, like black individuals often shame mm-hmm. their, you know, individuals living with HIV. I think we need to address like why these religious groups are seeing HIV like as a bad thing. Obviously some people quote the Bible or the religious mm-hmm. text as being prejudiced. I think we need to address why that exists because I just talked to a um, black woman professor 
who mm-hmm. mentioned that Black women have done a lot to raise HIV awareness and advocacy, but a lot of the times they're always neglected in the research, the funding, the education, et cetera, because people, even no matter how hard they try to speak up, people are always going to ignore them. And the people who are ignore them are the ones in power that's like creating the media, the attention, et cetera. It's yeah. so difficult, but with the age of social media, like, like you said, anyone with a platform, even if it's just two people in their audience, like if you do something, eventually you can get the traction and speak out and help reduce all these consequences. Yeah, and I and also it's okay to speak from your perspective. Mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of people often feel, you know, it's like the whole imposter syndrome where you don't necessarily want to step on certain toes. You don't want to sit here and tell the story that's not yours to tell. I definitely understand that. And I definitely think that is something that we should all think about before we, you know, fully take on a subject. But even what you saying, like the the fact that black women are often so ignored, they are some of the hardest hit communities. And Mm -hmm. one of the things that's really unfortunate about the shaming that happens is, okay, you are a uh, male, you know, a man of color, you uh, became infected somehow, I'm not sure how, but you, you have it, right? The moment that you disclose that to anybody, they instantly assume that you're gay because that's a gay disease. That's what, yeah. they, that's, that's what people say, that's not how I feel. That's what people are so quick to jump on and say, well, you must be gay. You must've been, you know, th- there's a lot of, people will rather not get tested than be labeled as gay, which is, absolutely insane to me Mm -hmm. because all that does is continue the cycle and um has a possibility of uh infecting others without you even realizing right uh testing is super important and most of the people um especially straight women they don't think about getting tested for hiv regularly in my gay circle of friends my, my friends they're on prep and they're getting tested regularly i have been married now for um Oh my God, I'm so bad with days. Please don't tell him. Uh, we've been together for <laughs> we've been together for 11 years. We've been married for half of that. I just don't want to say the wrong uh, the wrong number in case he hears this. Okay, and right. <laughs> but we, you know, I've been in this monogamous relationship for a long time. Um, but it's still something that I think about all the time because my friends are, um, you know, getting tested regularly. They are um, on prep, and we have those conversations openly. When I started uh, the the video, the picture that you mentioned earlier, the red, when I posted that, I got several women messaging me and it, it almost like they were thanking me for opening their eyes about something, which was wild to me because it's just such a normal and big part of my conversation with my friends and our conversations and our lives. It's always something that we have to think about that we've been, especially, you know, the 80s um, took so many of us. So mm-hmm. we are very well aware that, and we also have lost our own. It's not like the deaths have stopped. People are still uh, losing the battle. It's not, and that's another thing that people don't realize. They think that just because there are so many people who have been able to, to remain healthy through uh, taking their medication cocktails um, how they're supposed to, does not mean that it is not still taking the lives of so much talent. Um, and it, when I made that post, it was actually one of the more painful ones to do research on just because it it kind of broke my heart to see how little progress has been made. Yeah. Well, there has been there has been a ton of, you know, there has been a ton of progress, obviously, but it still broke my heart to see that that progress comes with ifs, ands, or buts. You know, you you either have the money for it or you don't. You um are you have the ability to seek good health care because that's another thing that people don't realize not everybody has access to the same level of health care yeah. that other people have and um you know shows like pose i think were it was super important in showing that because they talked about that openly they talked about uh, i actually learned so much about the hiv epidemic uh, through watching pose um and that just blew my mind the fact that so much of this conversation is under wraps and you have to seek it out, I think is one of the, the biggest depriments to the movement. For sure. And this conversation, what you're saying reminds me of how this silence towards HIV and, and assuming the epidemic is over 
because many people are able to take the necessary medications is very similar to the response to COVID. Many people just want major health crises like these to be over and they're willing to be silent about it just to quote unquote, go back to normal or assume everything is fine again. But all they're doing is just further endangering the lives of people who are poor, of people who mm -hmm. don't have access to these medications and especially communities of color. Yeah, I definitely agree. In fact, uh, I think that that's why I, when, when this start, started happening, it almost felt familiar because especially, you know, with the whole, um, with uh, when the vaccine came out, uh, mm -hmm. there were some, from my circle of friends, almost all of them were like, we're going to get it because we want to stay healthy and we want to get back into our regular lives because we have elderly parents. Um, you know, one of my uh, a really good friends, his mother is immunocompromised, so he did it to, to protect her. Um, and then we also had others who were weary of it. And, and I understand the hesitation, mm -hmm. however, there, in my life, I could not be around people and act like, even if I don't get sick, I could just not fathom getting somebody else sick, especially my mother um, or my dad, or because my parents don't have resources like that. They don't have health insurance. They, they and it sounds, I mean, when you say it out loud, it's pretty depressing, right? Like, they were trying not to get sick, not because they don't want to get sick, but because they couldn't afford to get sick. I understand, um, yeah. And uh, that's another thing that a lot of people aren't realizing that that's also being super heavily skewed to affecting poor communities and uh, people of color really harshly because they don't have access to people. And you see these other, you know, you see these wealthier individuals who um, refuse the vaccine and then get sick, but have the access to the good healthcare and they're yeah. fine. And, and, and so it's definitely parallel to it on a very different scale, but yeah. I think that it has shown how lack of valid and real information can really affect people. Um, I cannot fathom the amount of misinformation that was happening in the 80s when HIV really started, you know, tearing through our community. Um, but I think that this has shown if it can go, if this can affect anybody, including children and people still act like it's not a big deal, it makes me sad for just how alone the HIV people felt when it was happening, like during the epidemic. Cause I, I don't know if there was this film that I watched um, a couple of years ago and it's about the ward. Uh, it's a documentary film. And it's uh, the, the main ward in San Francisco. And it's basically the stories of the nurses who were working in, in the ward. And they were signing up for a job where they did not fully understand the uh, how it was contracted. Uh, they did not understand how it was passed from person to person. And they put their entire, their lives at risk. Because without any knowledge, you know, you have to take the risk yeah. to take care of people. And um, I just don't, I don't want people to forget that. I don't want people to forget just how much we've lost um just because for a long time the rhetoric was it's the it's a virus for gay people it's a virus for gay men just gay men that's the thing is that they're completely ignoring the fact that there are a lot of women who become um you know through drugs uh, are exposed to it through drugs or a partner who is not getting tested regularly because it does not care about your gender or your sexuality in any way um but yeah i I've definitely noticed a lot of the um, the same sentiments to um, disinformation when it comes to the pandemic that we're currently going through. Mm -hmm. And despite everything that's happening, I know that you've posted a little bit about your um, mental health hardships this year and whatnot. Hopefully yeah. that you, you know, even, I hope not necessarily that things are getting better, but that you are in a, happier mm -hmm. and more comfortable space now with everything that's happening hopefully you know things are going well for you um it's kind of hard to say yes I think that mm -hmm. I get really racked up I I will say that I um because I, I I'm sure you've noticed I basically went off social media for months mm -hmm. I completely I just put my phone down one day I just became so overwhelmed um, that I put my phone down and I just didn't pick it up for months. And um, 
since one of the one of the downsides to the way that I express my art, um, especially using myself as a subject, is that a lot of it can feel very personal yeah. and a lot of it can feel very draining. Um, and when I openly talk about things, it opens me up to people asking me about it or um, wanting to talk about it too. And that pride project that I did last year was, you know, I, every single color had its own meaning. So there's um, orange, what had to do with mental health. Um, I did red was HIV, uh, pink, I actually focused on, um, it, it was actually the, the main inspiration for the whole uh, project was the pink triangle that the homosexual men were uh, forced to wear by the Nazis. And um, that's where like the project really stuck into my brain and why I felt the need to do it. Mm -hmm. So when I was, you know, posting these things up, while it was very cathartic for me to um, get out all these emotions, it was also my DMs were filled with very lovely, but heavy conversations. So uh, this year, I just kind of took a step back. Uh, I do feel a lot happier. Thank you so much for um, wishing that. I I really do. But at the same time, I have a lot of anxiety because I feel like I could be doing more or I could be speaking out more or I'm not being as active or I'm not doing something that matters. But I also have to remind myself that if I was, if I continued at the rate that I was going, yeah. I would I would have been fully burned out and I would never be able to even have this conversation with you today. Mm -hmm. um, but it, honestly, and it sounds really you know, silly, but me taking this phone call and um, speaking with you about it, it's the first step in me kind of feeling like myself again and feeling like I, my voice matters. Because for so long, I mean, I'm sure you are a uh, woman of color yourself. Yeah. And um, it's really easy to uh, feel like you don't belong where you are. Like you, yeah. um, you know, the imposter syndrome is, it's intense. And um, at the beginning of this year, I actually did a, a um, collaboration with, um, it was actually a um, government funded project to get prep to people for free. Cool. And yeah. I, I don't accept very many sponsorships on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I, I don't like to sell things. That's never been my thing. I, I don't like to sell, um, but I love to talk about things that matter. So when they reached out to me, it was like the perfect partnership. Um, and I spoke about a lot of things and watching people's reactions um, people reaching out to me and telling me that they actually were able to get prep for free through the program that I promoted really, it, it, it lit a fire under me. To, it made me feel valid again. Um, having this conversation with you today and hearing that um, there's other people who want the same that I do, which is to, you know, bring down the stigma, um, to spread information and spread positivity. Um, I don't know. I just, I really thank you for um, for including me in this because it, it has been very nice. And I am very grateful to be part of this journey with you again. For this <laughs> project, uh, I was very excited to finally be able to speak to someone who uses art as like their, pro their passion, their hobby, et cetera, because as an artist myself, I know how draining and vulnerable it can be to like put yourself into your work and, you know, mm -hmm feel that associated burnout and so I was curious to know like what was your attachment with your art and what did the photography mean to you or how you express yourself and it was really insightful to always you know hear what another artist's life is like so to speak mm -hmm. yeah and I, was no, I definitely understand that and I was wondering if you do any like comfort photography like take photos mean? of things that like make you feel good like so I draw on the computer and whenever I'm feeling down, I'll just draw like my favorite characters, like feel myself again. And I was wondering like, do you do anything like that? Do you take photos of like flowers or scenery or oh. just people in the street to like regain your artistic juices or things like that? Um, I love, absolutely adore floral photography taking pictures of flowers, even though I don't post them anywhere. I, mm -hmm. it's just, it's something that I do for myself. I am obsessed with flowers. Flowers and butterflies are my two, I have them tattooed, several of them all on my body. I adore them. And there's just something so beautiful to me about taking a 
picture of something that lasts for two weeks. You know, flowers literally bloom and they're gorgeous for a week and then they start to wither away. Yeah. And something about, um, something that I've really, really, I've always been fascinated about photography is that I'm able to save the beauty forever and I'm able to capture and hold on to a moment or a gorgeous image or whatever I may be. And I'm able to keep that forever. Um, but yeah, I adore taking pictures of flowers. Um, that being said, I haven't done it in a while. And I think it's, it's really strange because I don't make myself feel better with my photography. I, I work through, I work through my, I have to feel my emotions first, right? Mm -hmm. And then once I start to unravel or, or unwrap them, I should say, I then capture images or I get ideas for, for pictures. I work through my trauma and my sadness. It's basically therapy for me, mm -hmm. um, but I also can't do it while I'm going through it. I kind of have to have a little bit of detachment to it. There was a, a, yeah, there was a period of time a couple of years ago where I had a very, very bad depressive episode that lasted for months. And um, what I thought at the time was really healthy to do was to photograph it and to document it. Mm -hmm. um, while I absolutely love the images that I created, um, seeing them once I was out of that state was too dark. Um, and it wasn't until it was actually the, I've only had a couple of, um, showings and it was the first time that I showed a full collection at an art show. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was so, you, you know, as an artist, I'm sure you understand you put all this time into a project and then you just release it into the world. And it's not until other people start to engage with it or comment on it, or even just ask you about it, that you don't realize that you realize how hard you exposed yourself I didn't uh, realize that I, yeah yeah like I didn't realize just how raw my images were until my husband teared up looking at them mm -hmm. it wasn't until at the art show somebody said I have felt this before that I was like whoa whoa whoa, whoa. I was just like in my head I thought I was just making some cool art but I didn't realize just how much I delve into my pain um but I definitely do use my art as therapy and I use my art as a way to heal, but not just myself. I think that that's what, um, why people are drawn to me is because while I expose myself to the world, I also am welcoming you to, to do the same. So I, I, I only really speak from my perspective because it's all that I have. Mm -hmm. However, when I, you know, as something as silly as a pink beret, I show up to a room in a pink beret and the three people who've always wanted to wear one but never wore one will compliment me on it. The amount of compliments that I get from straight men about the way that I dress or about my attitude, and it's just because they don't feel comfortable or they don't feel able to. And one of the big, big things that I do in my art and that I always try to do is I want others to feel less alone. And a lot of it comes from a selfish um, aspect of I felt so alone growing up and I felt so alone going through a lot of the things that I've gone through in my life. But I don't want others to feel that either. Like, I don't, I don't want someone to, to feel alone. So if you seeing me in um, a pair of high heels and a little bit of makeup having fun makes you go home and maybe not put on makeup, but you put a, a little bit of mascara but that made you feel a little bit more comfortable. The amount of conversations that I've had with people who told me that I encouraged them to try something new, to see the world differently. Um, girl, the amount of people, the, uh, the amount of um, middle class, upper middle class of white women during the election that reached out to me and said that I inspired them to vote for the first time. Wow. That is the, one, of the biggest, one of the biggest compliments that I've ever received in my life. Um, because when I was working in fashion, I was working in certain environments that were not very diverse. Yeah. Um, I was often the only uh, Latino in the room. I was often the only man in the room. Um, I was also 
usually the only queer person in the room. There was other girls who eventually came out um, to me privately, but the environments were not the most welcoming for people who were different. Mm -hmm. And I was always been, I've always said that I would rather be disliked by somebody because I said something that I'm passionate about than to be quiet and be liked by everybody. Um, and so I don't always make a lot of friends because I'm a little outspoken about a lot of things, especially during the, um, you know, the last two election cycles were very yeah. personal to me. Um, I am a Mexican immigrant who is queer. There is, there was, there was a lot of attacking energy coming my way, but me speaking out about it allowed others to vote for the first time. Like that is just insane to me. It's insane it to me that, that by me existing, I was able to influence people. I don't like the term, I will never use the term influencer to describe myself because my, my goal is never to influence people. My goal is to live authentically. And if you feel connected to me and somehow that inspires you, that's amazing. But I'm doing it because it's what I need to do for myself. Good, um, good. Yeah. I would say like, I almost teared up in a few, parts that you were talking about because like I don't know hearing you be introspective and like reflecting on these thoughts that just made me feel really supported and there were things that you spoke about that I myself uh felt like hey I can relate to this yeah and, th and but, that's what I love I genuinely like you saying that to me just it, it gave me chills I adore that something as silly, because you know, it can be some, of course I have these really deep conversations about mental health or mm -hmm. about HIV openly, but it can be something as silly as me doing a, a I, you know, I makeup look. And you think and see yourself, why don't I wear enough? Why don't I put on a little bit of blue eyeshadow yeah. today? Mm -hmm. it, it's just sharing experiences causes shared experiences and yeah. I love hearing that in any way possible, I have made someone's day better. Whether it's I made you laugh at something silly that I said, or I inspired you to go home and uh, redo your entire closet because you want more color or whatever it may be, you know, as, as silly. And, and that's one of my, the thing about Instagram, or at least on my page that I like to do is some of my images can, can just, it's just literally, I like this outfit and I took pictures. However, why that's okay. You know, a little bit of vapid vanity is not the end of the world. And I think that there's a lot of shaming that happens um, when a girl just wants to post a selfie and people call her self, uh, self-centered. Who else am I supposed to root for? Exactly, I, exactly. I don't understand. I've never understood that. Um, I don't like, while I, I try not to edit uh, my my body in any way because I used to be um, much heavier when I was uh, younger. Mm -hmm. And so I try to be really conscious about not portraying unhealthy body images. I, I, yeah. I never want to portray that on somebody else. But at the same time, if I know my angles and I know that if I turn my body slightly to the right, I look a little bit thinner. And when I look at the picture, I feel good about myself. I'm not gonna apologize for it. I think that we're just so used to, especially as people of color, we're so used to apologizing for existing sometimes, mm -hmm. whether it's being in the way, um, something that I didn't even realize I did until I started hanging out with uh, people who are much more free than I am in my life. Um, one of my best friends, she just radiates, and and she says it like in a joking manner. She radiates middle age white man energy. If she wants to, if she wants to walk through the aisle and get something, and you're blocking it, well, that's too bad because she's gonna get it. She, if, of course, she's not gonna be rude to you, but she's not going to wait for you to move. And I will always wait for people to move. I don't ever ask people to uh, excuse me. I apologize, even though I'm not in the way. I'm very apologetic. And she's just like, she just exists. And that it's, it's such a powerful thing to watch. I'm not going to lie. Mm -hmm. I wish that I yeah. had that energy. Me too. Um, I, I wish that I could just walk into any room and, well, I'm sorry that you're uncomfortable with my existence, but I'm going to be me because I still think about it. Um, but Again, the same way that I adore influencing others, I love being influenced by people who I find admire. Like anybody who I admire, I am willing to learn from them and change the way that I see the world. Um, but yeah, I do wish that more of us walked, you know, through the world as a middle 
uh, middle class white man. Yeah. I definitely think that we the could. The confidence of middle aged white men is unparalleled sometimes, but they, to, they are wow. In oh Crocs, they will literally no. walk through a store in Crocs and ill fitting clothes and think they are the one. And I wish that I had that little bit of it in me. Me too. <laughs> I, I, people of color, we just need to steal some of that white confidence, you know, maybe things would be a little bit better in the world. But speaking of your photography and your account, listeners, Luis's um, Instagram, Fabu Lewisly, I love the handle, by the way, will be linked Thank down you. below, hopefully. And uh, as we are wrapping up, is there any last remarks that you want to make for our listeners? You know, uh, I just want people, especially this last couple of years, um, have been really rough on everybody. And I just want everyone to realize that it's okay. I think the moment that the pandemic happened, everything turned into hustle culture and Mm -hmm. numbers, numbers, numbers. Even on Instagram, I was kind of, I kind of fell into it and I was chasing whether it was likes, comments, views, whatever, I was chasing it. And I burned myself out. And it wasn't until my burnout that I realized that it is okay for us to be burned out. It is okay for us to feel overwhelmed. Um, You don't always have to be brave. You don't always have to talk about things that are painful. When you can, you should, because I think it's important for us to have these conversations. But if one day I wake up feeling really bad, I'm not gonna force myself to be an advocate for everybody that day because I can't be an advocate for myself in the moment. Mm -hmm. It's okay to take breaks. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay to feel helpless, but just know that you are not alone. There are so many of us who are struggling with our mental health, uh, with our health. Um, There's, we're all struggling. And you're, even if you think it's something small, your struggles are valid. We have to keep talking about the things that challenge us. Um, We have to speak out for all of the people um, who have been lost to HIV. We have to have these conversations openly, not because it's comfortable or fun, but because if we don't, who is going to? Exactly, a very strong ending message for today's (laughs) interview. Thank you once again, Louise, for Louise, right? Yeah, Louise. Uh-huh. <laughs> Louise, thank you very much for talking with us today. And for me, especially, I know that I was definitely empowered and supported by your words. And this podcast will be released sometime in the future or right now, according to when you're listening to the viewers. But... <laughs>